Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our discussion on engineering standards, and we want to have a, a discussion about uh, the good and bad of standards and kind of maybe land on the in-between of standards. Uh, my name is Paul Downing. I'm uh, the president and CEO of ProStep, Inc. Uh, presenting with me is Brian. Can you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm a director of technical pre-sales at ProStep, Inc. Thanks, Brian. So uh, first a little bit about ProStep, and then we'll, we'll get right into the, the meat of the discussion. Um, uh, from an abstract perspective, uh, really, we want to kind of um, explore standards, right? Uh, we all use standards, whether we use it or not, whether we realize it or not. Um, they exist in our world, and especially in the engineering world, we're finding that there are so many standards to choose from. Uh, it's getting a little bit uh, interesting, at least on the implementation side, when people are saying, well, do you support standard X, Y, Z, and, you know, I, I need to have that to run my business. So from an agenda perspective, we want to talk about an overview of some of the common standards that, that we run into on a regular basis, uh, and then talk about when it's good to use those and when sometimes it's problematic to use those. Um, ProStep, if you don't know already, we're, uh, we consider ourselves a vendor independent company and what we mean by that is that we do not sell uh, products by other vendors, so other PLM vendors. We don't sell Siemens products or PTC products, for example. Um, we're also a little bit unique in that if you uh, look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see companies listed there, those companies each own roughly 10% of ProStep. Um, so we're, we kind of approach things in a different basis. We're not a big, you know, Microsoft-like commercial software company. We really operate more as a nonprofit organization. Um, and then there's a couple components of that that we'll get into in a moment. Uh, obligatory customers slide. Again, you know, we have customers in all industries. Uh, this is just a sample of some of the customers that we deal with. I'm not going to dwell on it, but uh, whether it's uh, automotive or aerospace or defense, you know, right. uh, we use those. Not a problem. Um, all right. And then the other strength uh, that we bring to the table with ProStep is our partnership. So, again, I mentioned earlier that we're a vendor-neutral company. What we mean is we have strong strategic relationships with these technology companies uh, such that we can create products that interface with these companies in a vendor-neutral way. Um, additionally, ProStep is involved in a lot of standards bodies or standards consortiums or industry best practice consortiums. And we'll talk about some of those in the upcoming slides. Um, so the first thing that we want to talk about is ProSteps, sorry, ProSteps relationship with the IVIP Association. So um, they both have the name ProStep. Uh, basically, uh, the IVIP Association is a nonprofit standards body or consortium. Um, it's comprised uh, of several hundred companies. Uh, those companies each own or contribute to this nonprofit organization. Um, and that organization, in turn, uh, helps come up with industry best practices and industry standards. So the ProStep IVIP is a nonprofit part of ProStep. And you can see on the slide here uh, a sample of some of the companies that are a part of that. Um, you know, this slide isn't updated to the minute, so there may be some other ones on there. Uh, when we start looking at the IVIP Association, you know, this was in 2019, our focus. And so through the membership, you know, we typically have somewhere between $1 and $2 million of annual operating income. Uh, and this group is very involved in developing and refining existing standards. So you can see a couple of them on the screen, and Brian on the next screen is going to start to go through of them, but you saw things there like JT Open, uh, you see things like uh, uh, LOTAR and so on, and we're going to touch on each of those. Um, Brian, yeah. you want to walk us through some of these? Sure, sure. So here's a couple of examples of the, the different groups within the ProStep IVIP, um, and these are working groups that 
are there to help best practices and standards uh, to develop them in the industry. Uh, so the first one that we're going to look at is the, the code of PLM openness. And what this is trying to do is bring together um, both industry um, as well as the software vendors themselves and try and, uh, you know, get a best practice down uh, a code or a codex, uh, if you will, of, um, you know, interoperability with that specific uh, environment. So that means that they're going to say, yes, we are going to support uh, the ability to get the data in and out of the uh, environment within these certain standards. And they've all signed on to this largely, being uh, Siemens, Dassault, PTC, and others. Another one is the Cross-Discipline Lifecycle Collaboration Forum. Uh, and this is trying to bring together also uh, different uh, suppliers, vendors, uh, and experts like ourselves in order to get the best practices together for uh, doing this type of cross-discipline, meaning uh, getting requirements and system models, electrical and software and mechanical designs, and linking that data together. Um, they've also developed some different, uh, different examples of this. And... Um, and have uh, you know put together uh, some good concepts about how to do that, uh, and then the Smart Systems Engineering Project Consortium. Uh, so also largely uh, compromised of, of different play, you know OEMs uh, in aerospace and automotive, as well as uh, experts within industry and software, and trying to come up with uh, the best practices uh, of how to handle uh, systems engineering integration itself. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I mean, uh, another one that's pretty interesting that I like is a sample project. Uh, this one um, is really about establishing what we call a chain of trust between uh, the engineering design and the end 3D printing. So uh, think, if you will, uh, you've licensed uh, a supplier to create 10 and no more than 10 iterations of uh, a particular component, right? So when they go to say, I want to print one of these parts, it's going to, through blockchain, go and say, I'm entitled to print 10. I'm going to reduce 10 down to 9. Uh, and now I've only got 9 remaining, right? So it's a way to establish uh, an ordering sequence, a licensing mechanism of the 3D parts that are printed out in the wild so that you don't lose control of your intellectual property. And so it's interesting. I like this because it shows you know, the role of government funding in this project, right? So in, in this case, in Germany, uh, you know, the, the federal ministry decided that it was important to invest in a project like this to help companies protect their intellectual property. And so, again, the, the whole point of all of these is that the standards uh, come from anywhere, right? They can come from any uh, industry. They can come from any government. Uh, but the important thing is, that there's, uh, it takes a collaboration of various companies to work on them. Um, and then speaking of companies, we mentioned before that we've got strategic partners with a variety of different companies. So, for example, with Siemens, uh, we're a proud PLM Foundation partner. That means that we can use uh, uh, their programs and their APIs to create our own products uh, our commercial off-the-shelf connectors, for example, to Team Center, NX, and so on. Uh, we also have partnerships with Dassault, uh, very similar. Um, so Dassault, for example, you know, we're a, a V6 partner, we're a Novia partner, uh, development service provider. Um, uh, we also have similar partnerships, as you might imagine, with PTC. So whether that's Windchill or ThingWorks, we can provide robust integrations with their products. Um, another example is Eris. Um, so we're a service provider, systems integration partner for Eris. And you're able to buy ProStep software through the Eris portal to connect Eris to a variety of other platforms. So uh, again, we just want to highlight the importance of uh, partnerships. Um, and how all this cooperation has to happen to evolve standards, to evolve interoperability. Brian? Yeah, so ProStep itself is focused on these, you know, uh, these technologies that are emerging within engineering. And, you know, that is the integration, really. And integration, in our case, is interoperability, 
And our name, even pro step, right, um, comes down to that neutral format. So trying to enable ALM, PLM, ERP integration, as well as uh, digital twin, digital thread, and digital master, and industry 4.0 challenges, you know, modern engineering issues. So we're going to jump a little bit into a standards overview. I like to review some of these standards because uh, it gives you a, an idea of different domains and, and how siloed things really are. Uh, and so, you know, within this model, this V model of, of engineering development and, uh, and execution, um, you know, you see that there's a lot of different standards along the, uh, the model, starting with REC-IF, maybe for requirements, um, but then other, you know, hardware and mechanical and software standards, uh, system modeling languages, uh, as well as uh, DMU and, and other uh, manufacturing standards, um, and then also test and validation standards. Um, so, you know, really there's a whole lot of different standards, and they don't really interoperate very well. So, you know, if you do want to build your digital thread, when you export something, it could be that it's exported within a single domain, and it might well represent that, um, but not really a cross-domain representation, uh, you know, just based on where it's from. Some of the common engineering standards that we see, like I mentioned, uh, REC-IF, um, and that's, uh, uh, you know, for requirements, as well as uh, Medellica, uh, XMI, and other uh, SysML standards for system design. Um, we see JT and STEP, um, you know, being common standards along mechanical design. Uh, and then there's other standards for, for hardware, um, electrical hardware and software, as well as PDF uh, that can be used uh, for, for kind of getting a, a document that's viewable and visible to others um, and a container, uh, maybe for other data that, that might not be uh, readily available within an environment uh, that those users want to use. So, um, but, you know, a wide variety of, of ISO formats as well as... Uh, you know, VDA and the Object Management Group, OMG, uh, and other standards bodies that are supporting this. I want to, you know, bring to, uh, to uh, a point also that you know, it, it, there is a, a need for standards in a point-to-point -point versus hub-and-spoke type integration. So if you're trying to move data between two places, you either have to create a bridge itself between those uh, different, uh, different systems, uh, or you need to enable a standard, right, that can exist on its own. And really what you're trying to do is move from this point to point to a hub and spoke kind of model uh, where that standard allows for you to uh, integrate and uh, interoperate with other systems, um, you know, without the need of, of um, you know, building that point to point style bridge. Now, there are some caveats to that. You know, there's neutral formats you need to predefine uh, beforehand, and that means that they're very semantically strong. Uh, so all the data needs to be well formatted, and the data is not always written out and read in, and the different interfaces that might be from different vendors the same. Uh, so uh, there is some, some catch to that. Now, there's been some also refinement in that, and so the longer-running standards, you know, we see our are more acceptable in, in the way they work. Uh, but you need to know everything beforehand uh, in order to do that. And, you know, it's very domain specific um, and not always good for, for uh, all use cases. So some of the standards we want to talk about today um, are, you know, ones within the engineering formats. Uh, so STEP and the ISO 10303 standards, you know, 203, uh, 214, 239, 242. And these are uh, engineering data formats that are specific for, uh, you know, understanding that, that geometry data, uh, but then also uh, other engineering data like bill materials, uh, configuration, uh, service data, and other things like that, uh, manufacturing data too. JT uh, and 3D XML, and I would kind of lump those together, uh, but JT being an, also an ISO format, um, but also... Uh, you know, a proprietary, heavily proprietary used format within uh, the team center environment. And 3D XML also for the same purposes, uh, being there for, for digital mock-up, 
um, and viewing and providing a lightweight format in order to uh, to use that data. And then finally, PDF and uh, you know using a portable self-contained document uh, with 3D or 2D data uh, that's supported through PDFE or PDFA and other standards um, you know that are uh, available uh, that allow anybody to look at this type of engineering data. Uh, we do have a, a, uh, a white paper, uh, this uh, 3D formats in the field of engineering. It does an example and, and, and kind of uh, goes through each of these uh, uh, and, you know, gives a comparison and contrast to this. So um, email us if you're looking for that, and we'd be happy to support you with that. So, Paul, you want to start us on some of this discussion? Absolutely. You know, uh, one of the things that strikes me in, in standards and, and as we're going through this is that there are so many standards out there, right? And, and it's one of the things we'll talk about as we go on. But uh, I find it interesting, you know, again, everything has a standard and not everything uh, was necessarily used for its uh, intended consequences directly. So, uh, one of the things I like to look at, uh, my example is the, the lowly USB port, right? So uh, it started out as a replacement to like an RS-232 serial port and a way to do high-speed transmission uh, between devices. Um, and to me, what it's really evolved into is this ubiquitous power supply, right, that's available anywhere in the world. I don't care where you go, uh, anywhere in the world, there is a device that is powered by a USB port, and people have USB ports, you know. Um, so it's interesting to me how something that started, uh, you know, in the mid-90s as a data exchange standard has really evolved a more important role as a ubiquitous power supply, right? So, so it's interesting to me how those standards evolve. I know when I used to travel, I would take 10, you know, different cords and connectors with me I take one, right? I take one power supply, uh, and I take, you know, two or three little adapters, depending on what I have to connect to it, and that's it. Uh, so that's that's a good thing, right, unattended consequences. Um, the other food for thought, to me, it, with standards is they, they seem to take forever, right? So uh, I'll use just one example, and I'm not picking on this by any stretch of the imagination, but... You know, the, the LOTAR, Long-Term Archiving Project, has a very important goal, right? And that goal is to make it so that uh, engineering data that you create uh, today is usable 50, 75, 100 years down the road without having to archive hardware and software and iterations and, and so on. It's an extremely important goal, right, because it's not sustainable for you to go back and fire up uh, you know, a CATIA workstation on a specific version from 40 years ago and hope that you can load your, your drawings appropriately. Um, but this started some time ago, even well before 2009, to the best of my recollection, uh, and it's still not done, right? I don't know that it will ever be done, but uh, there are so many moving parts to it. There are parts that are complete, and, and again, I don't have the real numbers in front of me, I'm sorry, but you know, maybe there's 50 parts to it and 35 of them are done. But I see that standards sometimes take forever to evolve, which which kind of begs the question, and then we'll talk about this on one of the later slides, is at what point do you jump into a standard, right? Do you jump into being an early adopter or a late adopter or wait till it's completely done before you even look at it uh, and those types of things? Um, you know, uh, another interesting aspect of standards, at least to me, uh, is the commercialization of de facto standards, right? So for the most part, what we're talking about are open standards that have gone through a formal review and become, you know, an ISO standard or pick your governing body standard, right? Um, but it's interesting. I, I, I'm dating myself, right? I've been in this industry about 30 years. But, you know, I remember a big uh, blow up about compression for GIFs uh, or GIFs, depending on uh, which camp you fall into, and that was based on a compression technology, LZH, LZW, that was technically patented by Unisys, right? And my recollection is uh, just before the patent expired, maybe two to five years before the patent expired, Unisys or a division of Unisys went around just suing the crap out of everybody on the Internet 
that was using gifts or um, uh, compression, right? And I remember the company I was working at, you know, getting a cease and desist letter that, okay, we're going to fine you X, you know, amount of dollars, and here's our lawyers, and you better have your lawyers call our lawyers and, and all that stuff. Well, you know, okay, fine. You own the patent. It's your luxury property. I got no argument with that. But what it really drove that I find interesting was, um, you know, the enhancement of the WC3 standards body and that organization and a whole bunch of companies around the world said, okay, we need to create a generic neutral format for compression and graphic data exchange. And we ended up with formats like PNG and uh, JPEG and, and other four right, that were available license-free. So I found it very interesting to see how, um, you know, maybe overzealous, in my opinion, enforcement of patents uh, can lead to other areas of innovation, right? So uh, anyway, some interesting stuff out there, I think. Yeah, and, and I'd like to add to that, too. Um, you know, that's part of the ProStep uh, Foundation, right? We're built in 93, but came out of a consortium that, that maybe had some of that need, too, right? So a need of, of lowering expense and providing interoperability between uh, suppliers and OEMs. Yep. So, uh, yeah, why don't we jump into a little bit of discussion? So we've got some different topics that we want to, to table here and, um, you know, trying to jump into it. Um, why don't I read them off and then we'll start uh, going through them. So the first one is, are all standards open? Uh, what makes one standard more open than another? Um, you know, I guess uh, for this one, um, standards by definition uh, should, I think, be open to to use, right? Um, and um, and open to be able to uh, be available in long term without um, without change to the definition, right? Um, so yeah. that you could be implemented. Um, now, what makes one standard maybe more open than another? I think is in its definition, um, you know, being that there might be one company or one organization that might be driving the creation of that standard, and it really is suited and tailored for that one, um, and maybe not for another. Uh, so, um, you know, I see this, uh, like, interchange format, OAGIS, uh, for the MES, um, and, you know, that might be just perfect for OAGIS, but it just, you know, or for MES systems, one in particular, um, but maybe not so great for, for the other systems that might be adopting it. Uh, yeah, I, I think a good example, you know, when I look at this topic is um, JT and 3D PDF, right? And I think these are uh, dear to our heart because ProStep had an important role to play in helping bringing these into the ISO open standard environment. Um, so I remember uh, explicitly being at uh, one of the conferences, I think it was GPDIS uh, in the early 2000s, and literally uh, I was on stage, <laughs> I wasn't sure how to respond, but a shouting match between uh, two uh, aerospace employees about whether or not JT was open and whether or not 3D PDF was open. And at the time, neither of them were, right? So. Uh, uh, the Adobe had published the, the PDF standard, but the 3D part of it was still proprietary, and and JT was held closely by Siemens, and uh, you know it, it was a brawl, but it went on for about 15 minutes. So you know, yours is an open minds open, yours is an open minds open, and and I think those are two good examples of um, uh, one company created this format and sponsored this format and very narrowly defined what could be used and shared and uh, exploited in the public. And eventually it took just a groundswell of support from other companies to, to force is the wrong word, but to, to uh, encourage the owners of those proprietary de facto standards to open them up, right? Because you had massive corporations that says, I'm not adopting JT. The first line of the JT license agreement says this is owned by Siemens and we reserve the right to revoke it and change it and do whatever the heck we want. And until that, and Adobe was the same thing, but until those organizations were kind of forced to give those over to a standards body, 
it was reducing adoption. Yeah, you know, but even to my knowledge, there's kind of, um, you know, two tiers in JT even today. There is. There is. Yeah, yeah, so a, the, a the and a ISO, ISO supported JT just doesn't have all the functionality of, of the ones that you might have within uh, within Team Center just because of the, the standards lag, right? Um, yeah. And, but on the same hand, I mean, I think it was Siemens that really was pushing the initiative uh, in order to put it through an ISO uh, standardization body uh, so that it could support their customers that were yep. really demanding that too. So, yeah, you know, I mean, but but good stuff. Um, what about the differences in, in the standard supporting organizations themselves? What do you see there, Paul? Boy, you got me. There are so many of those organizations out there, uh, and you just put, put, we put just a handful of them on a couple of the earlier slides. Um, it, it, it's interesting just in our own experience that uh, there are certain standards that seem to be driven by European communities and certain standards that seem to be driven by North American communities. There are some, uh, and you alluded to, that are maybe focused on industries. Um, you know, when I look, when I recall your V diagram that uh, showed 20 different standards, uh, you know, involved in trying to get something through the V diagram, you know, I kind of want to throw my hands up in the air. There are so many organizations and so many, I don't want to say conflicting standards, but uh, standards that address different areas, right? Yeah. And it's hard to know where to start. Yeah, yeah, and in some of my experience at ProStep, um, I see two different standards bodies that really kind of stick out to me, um, uh, and that's first the ISO, and then second the OMG. So, mm -hmm. and OpenPDM are are in one of our core integration products. Um, you know, uh, at one point in time, uh, we were supporting the STEP AP two fourteen uh, data exchange format, right? But even though we were supporting that, that didn't have a, a strict uh, interface, a computational model, or a data model that was actually represented in XML. And so they actually went to the OMG and then published the PLM services uh, that re just basically took what that uh, 214 uh, ISO model was and then made a actual usable format that we could put within our products, right? right. Uh, so, uh, so you know, some of that might be uh, some like uh, OMG seems more focused on usability yeah. uh, and putting in, you know, a, 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 a means of actually uh, readily making it available. Um, but the ISO maybe not so much, more about strict definition and semantics yeah, and, uh, and object model definitions and things like that. Yeah. Um, how about, what about proprietary standards? Um, you know, what do you see there? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, I, I come back to, uh, you know, the Unisys model. I, I think companies run a risk uh, of trying to come up with something that is so proprietary and so tightly constricted that it just forces the market to go somewhere else, right? Um, uh, I certainly want to protect companies' intellectual property, and I respect the investment that they've put into that intellectual property. Uh, but at, at some point, uh, it can get carried away too far, right? I think it's self-correcting. Um, yeah. So I, I'm not too worried about that, but uh, it is interesting to keep an eye on that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I see the uh, the 3D XML is a good example of that within uh, the Dassault ecosphere, which is fairly interoperable. It's XML, so you should be able to read it, right? In, yeah. in theory, you could take all that data and pull it out and then reconstruct it somehow. But, you know, just because it's there doesn't mean that the scheme is not going to change and they'll, you know, make an update and add some new definitions or, or um, you know, they can interpret it as perfectly as, as they do. So, uh, not many do, you know. I mean, it's just not well used uh, outside because it's controlled by by one company. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember early on uh, in our pro step career, we would run it, it, whether it's the Solar Siemens or PTC or anybody. They had their proprietary formats, and so I hesitate to use the word standard, but it was kind of a standard mm -hmm. for importing data into their system. And that's kind of what drove uh, the creation of the Codex of PLM Openness because what we were finding, and I certainly understand the logic behind it, is companies would allow you to import the data and publish specifications to import the data, but you had no way to get the data out. 
So if you had to share yeah. data across multiple platforms or multiple domains, there wasn't a good way to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, standards, a good or a bad thing, um, you know, I think they're largely good because they do, they create a real level, um, you know, I guess I wouldn't say playing field, but like a, a base set of requirements that everyone needs to work to, um, you know, within a certain industry. So if you look at a, a, an engineering step file that everyone can interpret, um, it has, uh, you know, the right kind of data with the right type of fidelity. Um, and it doesn't have all the things that you would want in order to model it. But, but I think it's creating a baseline for the industry as a whole. Uh, especially with its evolution to uh, something like step 242 and then enhancing, uh, you know, the uh, the annotations and tolerances and manufacturing data on that. Um, that's really driving it uh, to uh, to to make sure that that there is, uh, you know, good communication. I mean, also, I think they're good in that, you know, the the communication is successful. Um, so, you know, there is, uh, you know, a need for this between different proprietary formats or, or systems in order to, to exchange data. And really, ISO is, is one of the only ways, or, or STEP or, or, or IGIS or JT or something like that is really the only way to do that effectively. Yeah, I think uh, I'm kind of conflating, you know, the, the rest of the topics on, on this column, but I think the standards in and of themselves are a good thing. I think the way that they are um, sometimes developed and sometimes applied or not applied could be improved upon. You know, so a, a couple examples come to mind. One is, you know, uh, sometimes these standards, and they're complex, right? I mean, these, I, I could not do anything on these standards bodies. You know, they're, they are rocket scientists and, yeah. you know, uh, you know, men, the uh, members, you know, they're in the weeds. This is nothing that I could do. So I'm not maligning that at all. But uh, to me, they move so slow, right? Uh, if you want to get something done today and you know that someone is working on a standard that, that will address this topic, I've seen too many customers start off with a position that, um, I'm just going to wait until that standard is finished and that will solve all my problems, right? Without necessarily taking into account, A, that standard might never be finished. Mm -hmm. And if you're not an active participant in developing that standard, it might not address your particular need. So you could wait five years for the next iteration of step 972, just to make something up, right? And find out it still doesn't do what you need it to do. You know, I, I remember um, I around 2008, I was uh, at an aerospace company and uh, we were having debates between 214, step 214 and step 239. And uh, they liked the workflow features of step 239, but it was missing the engineering data. And they loved the engineering support in 214, but it was missing the change control. And they said, well, we're not going to deploy either of these. We're going to work in this degraded mode where everything is manual and paper and whatever until some super standard emerges that combines the best of both worlds, and then we'll hop on the bandwagon at that point. You know, as, as a systems integrator, uh, I remember just pulling my hair out going, you know, Either one of these will solve 80% of the challenges that you have today and make you 80% more efficient, but instead you're going to keep doing things the old-fashioned, slow way until some nebulous date in the future that hasn't arrived yet <laughs> where these two are combined into one perfect mega standard, right? So yeah. th those, are, those are the things that kind of trouble me about standards. I, I see too many people uh, just waiting for the perfect standard, and then I see other people because it's a cool buzzword, going, oh, we're going to rally around standard X, Y, Z. And we're like, that's a manufacturing standard. You're trying to move engineering bills of material. Why are you right? Why are you trying to shoehorn in engineering into manufacturing standard, right? Right. I mean, I think that that's a good example of the right and the wrong time in order to adopt standards, right? Um, so, 
Yeah, uh, it, to me also the the right time to do it uh, and is now uh, if you need have a need. Um, but the needs I think are also things of uh, moving data uh, between different uh, different organizations or moving data. Uh, you know, between, um, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, different different divisions or uh, systems and proprietary systems. Um, but, you know, if you're trying to shoehorn things in, right, like you were saying with, uh, with you know, using one domain standard as a as de facto because there's a lot of proponents in your organization that support it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, you know, you got to kind of pick and choose it in these things. Some I think are branching out too, right? They're they're trying to incorporate other standards underneath the umbrella. So you know, given all the past standards, you can use them in your your current standard. Uh, but you know, it's not always interpreted and things like that. So uh, you know, I think it's challenging. You know, is there a wrong time that you see or a right time for using standards, Paul? Yeah, uh, I, I do. I, I think you can either introduce them too early or, or too late. Um, I would personally err on the side of, uh, well, it depends on the use case. So yeah. um, if I look at some of the STEP standards, if uh, what I like about the STEP CAD standards in particular is that it becomes, I'm going to say the lowest common denominator. I don't mean that in a negative way, but it is mature enough that everything can read and write STEP. So that is a no-brainer to implement, right? Um, what I what I worry about, or what I see too often, is companies just implementing standards for the sake of implementing standards, and, and I think that's the wrong time. If you have a very closed use case and you just have to move data from A to B, uh, in that simple example, and you've got a tool that you've either developed or a commercial tool that does it, does it make sense to introduce? a standard into that equation just in case sometime down the road you need to bring in a third party to that conversation or a fourth party or whatever, right? Or um, should you just bite the bullet and do the standard now or wait until you actually have this interoperability need that's bigger than what the current use case is? So I, yeah. I, I don't know, right? It, it, everything's a little bit different. I, I just yeah. I don't like the implementing a standard just because uh, I'm going to get a checklist on a box that says, oh, this is a standard, uh, you know, implementation, whether it solves our problem or makes it better or worse, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, I do see some saturation in the market, uh, depending on what the standard is. Like, there's going to be different vendors that are going to support that. And once you get some, you know, many different vendors supporting some of those standards, I think that's uh, that's definitely a right time uh, mm -hmm. to use. That, and before then, right, if they don't support the main features of a standard, probably the wrong time. Uh, but, you know, I guess it depends on the use case as well, uh, you know. How about uh, yeah. facto? Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, well, you know, you, you bring to mind, I remember, um, I'm going to say some of the early days of OSLC, right? Yep. And it sounded really cool, and it is a cool way of thinking about uh, interconnectivity and, and uh, queries. but all of a sudden, you know, and, and this was before it was even a standard, right, in terms of, a, you know, officially certified, documented, that type of stuff. We had all these companies approaching us and saying, well, I need to know that you're OSLC certified. I'm like, it's, it's not even a standard yet. What do you mean certified? You know, yeah, we can't talk until it's OSLC certified. But even then, if you, you try and work in those environments, they are all implemented a little bit different, right? And, yeah. you know, and then they don't support different ontologies or components of ontologies that you want. I mean, it's it's the Wild West. And some of that might actually go back into what the organization is. I mean, this is a OMG data interchange uh, type format, you know, versus, or I'm not OMG. It's, uh, yeah, OMG, um, a data inter interchange format versus like a, a strict ISO format, right? Exactly. I mean, I right. feel like like uh, there's a lot more flexibility, but because of the flexibility, uh, you're also losing, uh, you know, uh, the the strength of, of the, the semantic definition of them. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. How about the, these de facto versus real standards? You know, um 
I think eventually when there's enough of a, a market share, most of the vendors do the right thing, right? When I look at um, most companies, if they get to a, and I don't know what the saturation point is, 60%, 75% or whatever, um, they, they do the right thing. They open up those standards, right? You know, it used to be if you wanted to open a Microsoft Word doc, you know, there was absolutely no way to do it, right? Uh, you had to have Microsoft Word, period, end of discussion. And now you can open it in Google Docs. You can open it, you know, any which way you want, right? Um, so it's eventually these de facto standards hopefully turn into, you know, open standards that, that can be used in, in real-world situations. Yeah, like your your USB, right? Or USB, uh, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, just de facto. Um, and, and I see that a little bit in engineering data, too. Um, but, yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, you, you know, you have a good point there um, that, that there is going to be a transition with enough market pressure uh, from, the, uh, from the, uh, the customers to the vendors uh, that they want to, you know, create this into a standard, even because it's, it was a de facto standard. Um, but there's a, a pressure to become a real one, you know, yeah. that, that's definitely there. Um, and, you know, who funds these initiatives? Um, so mm -hmm. I, you know, I see a lot of, of combination, really. So the government uh, definitely plays a role, um, you know, and uh, European Union, uh, as well as American governments uh, and others. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's mostly going to be the people in the private sector who are doing the definition and, and, and you know, actually spending money, uh, their own money on their own time in order to be involved in these bodies uh, that are making the demands. And I think those are the ones that really make it successful. Uh, so, yeah. you know, and, and I guess there's different levels of funding, right? So you can fund time or you can fund money or you know, fun work efforts in order to define different things or documentation, stuff like that. Um, but but I see the ones that actually come driven by private sector needs as the ones that are are uh, are the ones that are well defined. But, you know, in order to maybe get the initial inertia, right, uh, maybe the government funding is needed in order to do that. Yeah. What do you think? I, I, I think so, yeah. I, I think to be successful, it needs to be a mixture of public-private investment. And, and I think that private investment can come from uh, vendors like ProStep, right, that we've got a vested interest to make things work better. Uh, but I think it's more importantly to have, I'm going to say, end-user or communities of interest participate in this, right? So, you know, we look at some of these standards that take forever to complete, uh, I think a lot of times if you look behind the covers, it's they're underfunded or under-resourced. Um, you know, there's a lot of good intentions out there. Uh, I sat on a standards body in automotive uh, for about a year, um, and uh, it, it, it takes a lot of time, and, and, it, and it's, it's pretty torturous, right? Um, like, like we said before, you get into the minutia of everything, and... It's like, well, you know, um, should this be the standard resolution of this visualization display? Is it 720? Is it 1080p? Is it who cares? <laughs> but um, someone has to care, right? And that, that's yeah. the point. And, and so the successful organizations, to your point earlier, right, I see major companies saying, fine, I'm going to give you two of our technical fellows for the next 18 months to help finish step standard 937 because there's a problem there that we're trying to solve in the real world. And I think there has to be a real world component to it yeah. or it's not successful, right? You just have yeah. a bunch of people in room thinking about stuff that's totally different than something that can be implemented. Right. Where the rubber meets the road is super important. And I, you know, that's the, I guess, you know, what I see as one that's going to be a, de facto standard, one that's going to make adoption successful, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, how about some opinions? So what do you think the best standard for supplier data exchanges? I'm, I think I'm going to stick with STEP. Um, you know, um, it, it, it has its challenges. It's far from perfect. But, you know, back to my argument before, if, you know, 
what's the expression? Perfect is the enemy of good. Um, uh, it gets the job done in 80% of the use cases, and that's better than 0% of the use cases. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, for, for Lotar, uh, I'm going to take a stab at this one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, maybe step 242, right? You know, using uh, manufacturing data. But, you know, you like you said before, I mean, there's just too many facets to that. Um, and so, you know, you're going to find that you might need to use just a, a ton of different standards in order to do that. Uh, you know, PDF as well, you know, being mm -hmm. a good standard for for archiving and, you know, even with the PRC data and 3D PDF. Um, but, but you know, uh, you know, you might end up uh, wanting to archive electrical data and manufacturing data, different formats of manufacturing data and other stuff. So, right. you know, there's, there's a lot that's going to go on there. Um, yeah, and, I, I think part of it is what you're trying to accomplish, right, in terms of archiving. Yeah. I, I think, uh, and we run into this every day with customers looking to use us for migration projects, is there a value to keeping fresh and current and engineering CAD data that is 30 years old, right? And everyone's like, oh, we got to keep everything forever. Yeah. Uh, and maybe you don't, right? It, you know, I mean, I understand if, if there's a failure uh, or uh, something that you need to go back and re-engineer from 30 years ago. But even then, as long as you, in my opinion, and I'm, I'm not an engineer, but you, you, you leave enough technical breadcrumbs, it's probably more efficient in a macro view to re-engineer that part, right? So if, I, if I've got a representative either in STEP or JT or uh, PDF, it doesn't matter, but I've got the measurements, I've got the tolerances, I've got the features and functionality, and I need to remake a new widget, right? Um, maybe I don't need the actual native CAD data to go back and do that. Yeah, so that, that brings up a good point, right? So the ability to manufacture, it's different than the ability to, uh, to change the engineering of it, right? right. And, right. and to, to bring back, um, you know, what that engineering is, maybe isn't a value in the archiving, because you're kind of just, oh, I want to build another one in the future, you know, or something of that nature. Uh, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, how about uh, non-CAD user standards? What do you think, Paul? You know, it, it depends on how close you are to engineering. Um, I would say the closer you are to CAD and engineering, then I lean towards JT. Uh, the further away you are from CAD and engineering, then I would lean towards 3D PDF. And, and so what I mean by that, you know, JT is nice that you could, for example, bring that JT object into, let's say, Katia, for example, and have that as part of your object, right? Um, but uh, I think for our uh, ubiquitous platform, I like 3D PDF for its ability to uh, package data, protect data, digital rights management. And I know that JT has a lot of these components in it as well as of late, but uh, it, it seems that if I want to get something out into a parts catalog, into a purchasing agent, uh, you know, I think consuming it as a 3D PDF is more friendly than consuming it as a JT. Yeah, I mean, not everybody's got a JT viewer, definitely, right? Right. Yeah. And that was uh, I mentioned earlier that argument about Boeing. Uh, uh, I'm sorry about the uh, GPDF conference. That's exactly what the argument was about. Uh, and people said, uh, even if JT was free, which it is now, but even if JT was free, I would have to deploy that on a hundred thousand desktops, right? Yeah. I already have PDF reader deployed on a hundred thousand desktops, so my incremental cost to support 3D PDF instead of JT is zero, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is, you know, definitely uh, definitely a bonus. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, what about final thoughts on, uh, on some of these formats? Um, you know, I, these might be going from at least the steps from old to new, so it might be unfair. Um, but, you know, and me, I'm really well-versed in the 214 uh, – 
PLM services, you know, from our, our legacy here at ProStep. Um, and I think it's good and comprehensive, but but also maybe doesn't meet all the challenges. You know, it's good for PLM data, um, you know, and, and I think some of these might stick within a certain domain a little bit more, like 239 is good, you know, for, for maybe, uh, you know, lifecycle services and support and, and sustainment uh, possibly. 242, engineering and manufacturing, right, but also can bring in other data from other domains, um, you know, and there's there's a spattering of other things in electrical and, and requirements and mechanical and, you know, other stuff that's in there. Um, but, yeah, I mean, generally, step 242 is the wave of the future, at least as step goes. Uh, and I feel like, you know, the other ones are, are being left behind a little bit and not well-maintained, yeah. Well, one of the things that I found, uh, and I don't know if your experiences are different, but in the in the sales and consulting process, this used to be a really big topic. We used to spend a lot of time talking about: uh, Are you based on two fourteen? Are you based on two thirty nine? Are you based on two forty two? Are you JT? Are you three D PDF? We used to spend, I you know, I don't know. 25% of the sales cycle talking about this stuff. And mm -hmm. in my experience, it never comes up anymore. Yeah. So uh, I think on one hand, that speaks to the maturity of these standards that people are taking them for granted, right? Just like I know mm -hmm. I can plug in my USB, de USB device anywhere in the world. I don't have to take an extra charger with me. I think these are now mature enough and ingrained enough in all the platforms that it's not a question, right? So people are just like, oh, you need to get from Katia to NX. I'll just step it out, and then you can import it in NX, and we'll move on, right? That used to be, you know, two days of workshops discussing how to get data from, you know, Katia to NX, and, and nobody brings this up anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, and there is there is a little bit of compatibility. I think that that it depends on the use case, too. Like, I feel like between there and CAD, it seems like it's, fairly well buttoned down um, yep. just because the uh, like multi CAD compatibility and things like that have driven the, you know, the different formats to be well supported enough that, that, you know, and the vendors support the other formats well enough that there isn't such a need for it anymore. I mean, even if under underneath the, 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 the hood there, it's actually using a step or some kind of neutral representation in order to do that. It's transparent maybe. Right the user right um you know definitely definitely um you know i'm i'm a big proponent of uh 3d pdf and prc as well um you know i think that uh the html5 uh is also you know mm -hmm. maybe something that that's not listed on here that that maybe should be um and you know using engineering data within visualization now how html5 is going to turn out i mean there's not a lot of can't take a, you know, you can read a tolerance on it, but you're not going to take a measurement, right, without right. You know, some right. support in the background uh, for for rendering another format uh, within that. So, um, but, you know, you know I, I'm in JT, I think works very well within certain constraints, uh, data exchange and team center um, and NX and Katia environments, you know, I think those are good. I don't know, what do you think about those? Yeah, in general, I would tend to agree, you know, with, with your opinion on that. The, um, the, like I said before, you know, the the close you are to engineering, I would lean towards JT. The further away, I would lean towards 3D PDF. And and H HTML5 is definitely something to to keep an eye on. I mean, it's out there, it's usable, right? Uh, we have products that that uh, render to HTML5 uh, just fine. Um, it it's hard to see yet if that is going to replace these other things or just be uh, another aspect of it, right? So, you know, one of the challenges I've seen with um, kind of monolithic files, whether it's in JT or 3D PDF, is that they become fairly large and, and uh, unmanageable, especially when we're talking about CAD data. And I think that's where HTML5 comes to play, not so much the format itself, but that, like you said, you've got to have some sort of uh, server behind it that's mm -hmm. pushing content out that can be yeah. consumed, uh, and so I think that is really what's what's moving it and and cloud and all that good stuff, right? So I, I think the other formats are starting to decline 
slightly or or the tarnish is coming on a little bit um because they just they get to be so big yeah it, those other formats i think are are still important right i mean you can still yep. read the the 203 data you can still bring it into a cad uh even if you move from you know katia v3 to katia right. v3 to five to six right so yep um, you know, I mean, those are, that's an important distinction, I guess, you know, at least in 3D. Nope, um, I yeah, I, and, you know, and when you're talking about HTML, I, you know, I started thinking, yeah, I mean, there's still WebGL, and there's other standards that are underneath the hood in order to make oh, that yeah. happen. You know, yeah. if it's not a, a rendered server-side thing like you're talking about, which is probably the right way to do it, uh, because, you know, it supports the features that you're looking for uh, yep. within the engineering, yeah. yeah good. Awesome. So, you know, obviously our, our intent was to have this as, as kind of a live panel discussion uh, in front of our audience, and, and given the current uh, state of things in the world, that didn't happen, but I hope this uh, filled the gap a little bit. Um, and you feel free to reach us uh, offline. Uh, you've got my email address here, Brian's email address, and uh, of course our generic uh, websites, ProStep.us and ProStep.com. Um, so if we can answer any questions for you uh, or you want to join in the discussion, uh, we'll be happy to have you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.